between the 80s and 90s, the height of the Walkman's popularity was at its peak, and more would come after it, such as the Discman, which is basically a Walkman but played CDs, and then along the line came the MP3 players like the iPod. And although now people don't tend to carry around portable music players like before, because of that being able to be done by the comfort of your smartphone, it is still interesting to see how far some of these things have come. Although Sony did make a new quote unquote Walkman, which Sally doesn't play cassettes, but instead is an MP3 player? Yeah, you do you, I guess. But how did all this start? Nowadays, it's pretty normal to be able to listen to music anywhere you go, whether you're on a road trip or doing your homework. So let's go back. Prior to the Sony Walkman, there really wasn't any good way to listen to portable music, and even though there were already portable radios and boomboxes, it wasn't exactly a personal experience when it came to listening to the music. But that would all change on July 1st of 1979, when Sony would introduce the Sony Walkman, specifically the TPSL2. Although technically there were Walkmans that existed prior to the TPSL2, like the Sony TCM600 and the Sony TC50, which got to go to the moon. However, this was the first to be marketed as a Walkman. The reason why it was named the Walkman was because you could listen to your own music while you walked around. What may seem like an idea we're used to nowadays, back then in 1979, this was huge. At first, many people doubted that Sony's new product would sell, due to it costing $200 at the time, which is now roughly $735, and the inability to record music. Soon, other companies began to jump in on this new idea as it sold out in Japan. Eventually, Sony would sell the TPSL2 Walkman to European and North American consumers. And by 1983, the cassettes outsold vinyl for the first time in history. And by 1986, the word Walkman became a part of the dictionary for any portable cassette player with headphones. As the 90s came around, the Walkman still did well while others' technologies rose. And Sony would enlarge the Walkman brand with the Discman and the Mini Disc Player. However, it wouldn't be until the early 2000s when the iPod was introduced, which marked the death of the Walkman. And Sony would discontinue portable cassette players by 2010. Thankfully, the Walkman story doesn't end there. In 2014, Marvel would release a film based on their comics by the same name of Guardians of the Galaxy. And with this movie, a lot of people, including me, were introduced to the concept of a Walkman. I remember sitting in the theater, watching that movie for the first time, thinking that what Star-Lord had was cool as hell. After this movie, the TPSL2 and many other Walkmans would increase in price when being sold, and sales of cassettes seemingly shot up. And eventually, I got into cassettes too, and other analog formats due to how interesting and much more hands-on it is. So thankfully, more than a year after I got my first Walkman, I was able to buy myself the TPSL2. Upon arrival, I noticed how good the condition was for a Walkman, and opened up the battery container to see that there was barely any corrosion. The tape had looked to be in good condition as well, seeing that there was no grime or rust on it. In overall, it felt pretty solid as it was made out of a metallic material instead of the more plastic and mass-produced ones. Keep in mind, the model I got is technically the second generation, as the first generation was sold to Japanese consumers, and the second one was a more revised edition for European and North American ones. But despite this, the second gen of the TPSL2, in my opinion, turned out to be a lot more iconic, to a point where it's shown in movies. When comparing it to a newer Walkman, it was sort of strange how the newer one was a lot thicker. However, the TPSL2 made me appreciate Sony's craftsmanship, especially when put next to my WM-F10. And while I was at it, I compared it to a third gen iPod. Crazy how they're 30 years apart. After that, I popped in some batteries and the operational light lit red, which is a great sign. However, the spinning mechanism was not spinning as it should be. I pressed the play button again and put my ear close to the Walkman, and I could hear the motor working. Basically, this tells me that this is probably a bell problem, which is pretty common with these old devices. However, the fact that it's not spinning at all, not even a tiny bit, tells me that the belts probably snapped or are really stretched and warped out. So I had to order some new ones, and while looking for some, I was very, very, very nervous to take on this project, since this was my first time in repairing a device like this. Around three weeks later, the belts finally arrived and were packaged pretty neatly. Now it was on to repairing it. The hardest part when it came to repairing this was taking it apart, as one, it was extremely, and I mean extremely stressful, and two, everything was so jammed in there, so I was really worried it was damaging it, but thankfully, my dad was there to help me out. We eventually got to the belts, and sadly, I wasn't able to get much footage of us taking it apart due to how hard it was for my dad and I who were doing this for the first time. So, as we can see from here, the original belts were definitely worn out and no longer had that circular shape. After putting in the belts, the motor began to spin the belts, 
which was honestly so mesmerizing to see function. Then I tested it out with one of my custom cassette tapes, and it sadly ate up the cassette tape. So now there was a new problem. It was spitting out the tapes. I tried doing some research and I came to the conclusion that it was because it was playing the cassette backwards, which is why it was spitting it out rather than pulling it in. So yeah, we had to reopen it again and thankfully we managed to put one of the belts correctly. Now it was time to test it out and it works. And it sounded surprisingly really, really good for a Walkman that is over 40 years old, considering it was the first one. After testing it out, my dad and I were very content and we gave each other a good high five. But we were really, really tired and I had a killer headache from the stress. So we decided to take a break before putting the Walkman back together. The next day, we continued putting it back together, making sure all the screws and buttons were in place. After that, I screwed in the silver piece back into the Walkman and put the blue cap on top, which was sort of hard to do with all the wires. Then I put back the spine for the Walkman, and now here was the hardest part. Inside the battery compartment, there's a place for the spring, which is for the cassette door mechanism, which I will show later. As you can see, I had a hard time doing that, so I stopped recording and asked my dad if he could help, and it proved to be tough. Yes, the spring would sometimes shoot out and it even hit my dad's forehead. Following that, I put in the remaining screws, and it was now done. The very first Walkman was now fully operational. For its time, the TPSL2 certainly was beautifully minimalistic in its design, and the quality of the Walkman for itself is really, really good. Similar to Apple's new products, many of Sony's products during this era were made of aluminum. What really made this user-friendly is how organized everything is. The blue region is, for the most part, made to contain the cassette itself. And for the silver piece, you find the mini controls neatly arranged. Another thing to know was how you could raise the volume for the individual parts of your headphones. If you make your way to the top, you find two headphone jacks, an orange button, and a light, which indicates whether the device is working or not. What also makes this device very cool is that you and your friend could listen to the same cassette, and if the music was really loud, you could use the orange button to talk to them without stopping the music or taking off your earphones. In order to get the device working, however, you just need two AA batteries. You then have to turn it over and open the battery latch by pushing towards the center. This is also where you can find the serial number for your Walkman. The smaller it is, the more valuable it is. Another one of my favorite features of this Walkman was the door mechanism, which was so satisfying to open and close with that springy feel. And the eject mechanism, as it would smoothly lift the cassette, giving the product a very professional feel. After you're done listening to music, make sure you take out the batteries to reduce corrosion. And if you want to be efficient, you can use the strap to remove them both. And that is the TPSL2 Walkman. I never thought that I would be able to get my hands on one ever since I saw it in theaters due to how expensive it had gotten over time. But years later, after searching for one, I'm glad that I was finally able to get one and fix it too with the help of my dad, of course. Devices like this make me appreciate the craftsmanship that comes with the innovation of technology. And I am astounded from how long it took for the concept of a personal audio player to become a realization. There's just something great in being able to pop in some earphones and listen to your own music without disturbing others. Which is why this device changed everything. I'm Rishihara, and I'll see you all next time. Bye.